Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Christ and Coffee podcast. Today, we have Arthur Asadurian from the Apologia Center talking about the resurrection, talking about apologetics, talking about his ministry for this Easter week. And uh, we're going to talk all things apologetics uh, with the emphasis on the resurrection, the central message of the Christian faith. So, Arthur, it's good to see you, brother, all the way from California. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Hike. Of course. How you been, my friend? Pretty good. Pretty good. Just running around. Uh, being a dad to three kids, first and foremost. Yeah, <laughs> and so, yeah that's amazing. Busy. Yeah, and then there's like it's Holy Week right now, so anyone who's pastoring, this is like the NBA playoffs for all clergy. Yeah, Just man, nonstop uh, services this week. Yep. And you see people that's you true. haven't seen in a while, and then they're like, "Here are my problems." Like, okay, <laughs> I want to help, but can we space this out over the course of the calendar and avoid the holidays? But we're here to help. That's what we do. Yeah. So it's funny. I got. I got like. Uh, I don't know, two, three people text me uh, beginning of the week, end of last week saying, hey, can we meet up next week? And I was like, no, we cannot. <laughs> and that was like a very basic response. Like, we cannot wait until after Easter until we finished everything and then we can get together. Yeah, that's awesome. So you, you're, you, you went to seminary, but with the goal of focusing on apologetics, right? Like that was the, what's, what's the story of getting you to that point of, of like wanting yeah. to be more of the intellectual defending the faith route versus like, I'm going to be a typical pastor. Cause I, I think this is beautiful because some people may not want to be a local pastor, but they might receive a calling to be like, I love apologetics. I want to talk about Christianity. I want to share that faith with other people. So what made you become uh, an apology apologist? Is that a word? Yeah. Apologize? Apologists? Apologist. It, yeah, that works. Uh, so I went to Bible college uh, and I minored in education. Um, and so my goal was to to teach high school history. Uh, but I went to Bible college because that was I, convenient. I was part-time youth pastor. And I was like, dude, I get biblical studies. You know, I get a, I, uh, I get a degree in biblical studies. So I learned stuff that I love. Then I'll go get my graduate degree in teaching and credentials and then end up teaching history um for high school students and as i was doing my student teaching i realized this is probably not something i want to do uh -huh. um predominantly because of the system the education system and the way it was set up uh, sort of felt like a lot of babysitting and not much teaching during that time in bible college i this one semester and i forget which year it was but i took three classes that kind of coincided with one another and and put me on this path um, i took a theology one class uh, which for anybody who's been through Bible college and seminary, you know, theology one is all the like basics, foundational kind of Christian beliefs and who is God and what is God and all this stuff. And it was taught by a professor who had a New Testament degree uh, from Talbot School of Theology. Uh, and then he had his uh, PhD from Oxford in philosophy. And so you could see how that would all work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took a I took an ethics class that semester, which uh, again, we're dealing with all sorts of ethical issues. And then I took a it was sort of it was called roots of modern and postmodern thought but the best way i can explain is that it's a introductory philosophy class now i gotta clarify here uh, a lot of people that are used to like community college or philosophy 101 classes um even in university philosophy 101 classes get taught more like a history of philosophy class rather than a philosophy class this class was an intro to philosophy class we did philosophy uh, we didn't jump into, you know, individuals and kind of their ideas. It was kind of like, here are the ideas, deal with it, write a paper on this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so... So it wasn't like a, a trajectory of like, here's Plato, and then here we are now, everything is meaningless. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, like that's the trajectory <laughs> of human civilization right now. Okay. Cor correct. No, it, it, it was just philosophical ideas, uh, specifically that pertain to the Christian faith. Uh, but we dealt with kind of a wide range of stuff, but we were doing philosophy. I mean, I remember my professor saying, Hey, don't think you can, uh, you're going to quote Plato and somehow I'm going to be like very impressed because Plato said a lot of dumb stuff. So, uh, you know, you can't get by like that. You have to do your own thinking. You got to be a critical thinker. Um, and so as I was going through these classes, I got introduced to a number of Christian thinkers. So one of the books I read for that roots of modern and postmodern, um, thought class was a book written by uh dr jp moreland yeah right, called love your god with all your mind and so this this book i would i was just like shocked by it right like in the introductory pages of the book he goes into how christians have kind of 
you know, escaped from the academy and, and we tend to think our, uh, we tend to throw our brains out. Um, and, uh, and so it's an, it was encouraging. He dealt obviously with some philosophical stuff, like soul body kind of stuff. And so I was like, wow, this is really cool. And then that was the period of time where I was like, I don't know if I want to go into teaching. And I said, well, man, these guys that I'm finding out about are pretty local here. They, they, they all teach at Talbot. Um, and I said, well, I can go to Talbot and get a, get an MA in philosophy. And I had a, had a classmate uh, who was a couple of years ahead of me who had gone ahead and gone into the philosophy department at Talbot. Uh, and so I called him up, talked to him. He let me know how he got in. And so I applied for it. Uh, well, I was planning on applying for it. And then I was TAing for another professor who was finishing up his PhD at uh, Talbot. And he told me, hey, are you sure you want to do philosophy? <laughs> he seriously like discouraged me. Uh, but in a good way, he said, look, you're kind of hyped right now. You're kind of in the educational, yeah. you know, yeah, mode. I, mean, I, I feel like philosophy is like a starving artist degree. It's like, it's like, so you, know, I, you know, you'd be surprised how many companies want philosophers. Yeah. Now, I was recently reading an article where they were talking about a lot of philosophers getting or philosophy majors getting certain jobs because they tend to be individuals who are more critically minded. Yeah, and, and, and so they're not working in philosophy. You're right. Not working in philosophy, but but yeah, I mean, I think there's a study that says those with a philosophy undergraduate score higher on the MCAT and the the LSAT. Like, yeah, it, it, it does teach you how to think with words, which is everyone needs to learn philosophy. Like, I'm a huge fan. Yeah, of yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know how someone can do theology. Yeah. Uh, without knowing, uh, without so, knowing philosophy. So so what is this degree specifically? It seems like it's a little. What, what's the name of that? Like, is there like a is this a, what, what degree did you end up getting? Uh, well, it's an MA in philosophy. MA in the, philosophy. The, okay. Yeah. So it's it's it, the official title is a master's in the philosophy of religion and ethics. Okay. That's predominantly because I would say, you know, like in the early 90s, Christians were kind of creeped out with when the program started in the early 90s, by the way, uh, were creeped out just by like philosophy. A lot of people think you get a philosophy degree, you become an atheist. That's also true in the church, but it's not true in reality. Right. right. Uh, but so they, they went with that title, but it is a pure philosophy degree. Talbot doesn't want to get a PhD, uh, give a PhD in philosophy because they want their people to go get their PhDs in secular universities and end up teaching um, and, and being a light for Christ and doing good philosophy in different places. Yeah. And so and use Christian philosophers, which is saturated in the Christian thought, just teach what they teach. Um, yeah. 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 I always find that in like the, like I was one class shy of a philosophy double major just because all my electives were philosophy. Go and back. I was, <laughs> I was, yeah, just one class shy. Um, I, I, and I didn't care, but but it was funny. But like I, I had multiple classes where it was very common. Like we're going to talk about the problem of evil and uh, here are the Christian arguments for the problem of evil. And it's like they bracket these great Christian thinkers apart from their holistic approach. Yeah. Like they'll take Anselm and not put it in the Christian context or they'll take um pascal's wager where he's just like reflecting in his diary like he and, and they, they, they deconstruct these proofs of god and it's just like is, is is philosophy just trying to disprove god and and sometimes i felt that was the case in some of these classes yeah that's uh, probably more like the more the professor trying to do that rather than philosophy mm -hmm. obviously i mean philosophy is a tool but you know it, it's it's sort of sad uh, that people do this because there's a reason why Pascal is, is, you know, this thought experiment he's doing, there's a reason why he's doing that. Right. And you can't just like disconnect him from his Christian faith. Right. You can't disconnect whether it's Augustine or, you know, and so on. Like these guys were foundational to Western thought, we could say. Um, and so we have to take them within their entire worldview. Yeah. There was no atheists to refute back then. There was other world religions that they were yeah, and, and and yeah so so some of them are uh reflecting on the ancient thinkers yeah. and they're finding agreements and disagreements yeah so I, in plato you see agreements and disagreements uh, sorry in, in augustine you see agreements and disagreements with plato um and his contemporaries uh but you're also seeing them deal with like theological opponents um right like pelagius and so on and so yeah, forth yeah, yeah. and i I, one of my favorite Armenian thinkers is Esnik, and I think you're continuing that tradition. Right? Like he he solves the problem oh. of evil, the 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 whole uh, 
Um, he even goes after Greek thinkers, right? That are yes. not, it's not Christian thought, you know? Like, it was really cool to have the, this Armenian um, guy. Yeah, so, the yeah he's, he's one that, uh, that uh, people would classify in this category of being like an apologist yeah. philosopher. I personally, um, I've got my hands on a commentary that uh, Greek or Tatev Atsi wrote, Gregory mm -hmm. Tatev. And I would classify him because he's Middle Ages, sort of kind of like a contemporary you know like a century or two separate from uh aquinas and um he's the way he writes and his style and i, I would say he's probably fits into this category of like a philosophical theologian yeah so yeah. I, I enjoy that there's some stuff in english that you can read so it's great yeah, yeah. if you could send some links over that'd be great i know yeah, yeah. It, it'll be awesome so all right so you get this degree and then you begin this ministry uh no, um, I, I got this degree and I was pastoring in the church okay. um, and um, it, it going great, but always with a, with a apologetics bent. I, I'll tell you why, because my predominant work was with college students, young adults. So either in college or coming out of college. And I, I realized, and when you look at the statistics, uh, you, you can't avoid it, I guess, um, that the church is doing a horrible job of preparing young people in youth group to go into college or when they're in college, they have these serious. <laughs> what, what the, the seeker sensitive, be cool youth pastor is not working. Is that, is that what you're trying to yeah, say? Yeah, it's definitely not working, <laughs> okay. right? Yeah, yeah, like let's let's eat pizza and play wiffle ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and people walk away from Christ. 80, 86 percent of people walk away from Christ right. in their college years. I mean, that's crazy. Like, not, look, I wasn't raised in the church. I came to Christ when I was 18. Um, and, and maybe we'll get into that. But um, so my function kind of is different, like, um, on, on uh, some of these issues. So I realized, Hey, the, these folks in the church, my, my youth in the church and my young adults in the church, I got to prepare them. Uh, so I started dealing with all sorts of philosophical kind of, um, and apologetics related issues. And so I was pastoring, but it's always had, uh, and it always had this kind of bent to it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so um, a number of years ago, uh, I got introduced to some people and they were like, come to Armenia and, you know, we, uh, we'd love to have you. And uh, they, were asking, uh, they were actually asking me to move to Armenia. And I said, no. Uh, and then went there, did a week long apologetics training with some friends. Uh, and then came back and then the Lord really started convicting me over moving there. Um, and so were my wife, born, were, were you born there? Uh, I was. Yeah. What, what time, when did you immigrate come here? So I was born in Armenia in 1985. I'm, uh, came to the United States when I was 11 years old. Okay. So then, so then you come, when, when, when did you go to Armenia? Was that like, I had year? not gone back to Armenia, okay. uh, since I'd moved here and I went to Armenia 2018. Um, yeah, you see, yep. That makes sense. 2018. And then when I got back, so I, we were in Armenia late June, I think, 2018, got back. The Lord started convicting me. I told my wife, we prayed about it. This is already, we're in May at this time. So we're kind of May hearing, hitting August. I, we just had a baby, by the way. Our son was born. I got back from Armenia. And wow. A week later, our son was born. Uh, he was born May 5th. And uh, probably sometime in August, I want to say told my wife, Hey, Lord's convicting me. I think we should, we should move to Armenia. She prayed about it. She said, yeah, I, th I think we should do it. And so 2019 March, like March 1st, I think, or March 3rd, something like that. Uh, we were in Armenia. Wow. And we stayed there for a year and a half, I think like nine, 19 months. So, yeah. Um, and so started this apologetics ministry and um, predominantly because there's no apologetics ministry being done in Armenia. Yep. Um, and so we're working with different organizations, doing our own stuff. I got a team in Armenia. Uh, we're trying to partner with all sorts of different folks. And, and so, so I'm just curious, what, what what would be common apologetics questions for like a, a country that's predominantly Christian? Like what 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 are the common? But but they're also like a hundred years of the Soviet Union atheism yeah. there. So like what what are the like I I know like. We could talk about the, the questions you get in the Western academia world. I, I'm, I'm familiar with that, but I'd be curious. What are some of the like apologetics I, questions you get in Armenia? I, I 
personally don't think there's a difference there in the questions. Okay. So let's cl- let me clarify here. I don't think there's a difference in the questions. I think there's a difference in the context of the questions. Okay. So for example, um, whereas in America, you would regularly come across this question, like if God is so good, why is there evil in the world? Yeah, problem of evil. If God is yeah. good, why is there bad stuff? So we're everyone's going to deal with that. In the Armenian context, it's more contextualized. It would be, well, if God... If we were the first Christian nation and God's been with us, why did the genocide have to happen to us? Right. Right. So it's a lot more personal, a lot more like hey, <laughs> we, we have a specific first... <laughs> evil we're talking about here. And yeah, hey, and... we're on Team Jesus. What's wrong? What's going on? <laughs> but some of that's also like, hey, we were the first Christian nation. Yeah. We've been we've been faithful to God and you know, all these conquests and all yeah, this yeah. stuff. So it's you there's sensitivities that I think if you're not connected with, yeah, you might just miss out. So just sitting there and saying, well, you know, here's a logical response to the problem of evil. And there's the way to, you know, might not work, but it's the same question in essence. So, but you're still going to get questions like, um, well, hasn't the Bible been changed and corrupted? Right. That's um, a most evidence for that. You know, yeah, it's yeah. a common one I hear amongst Armenians all the time. Can we talk about that? Because I feel like I get that all the time in New York. People just assume the Bible was created when Constantine yeah. <laughs> converted the nation and that we don't really know if Jesus really existed. And I get this from uh, like super educated people who just were not growing up in the church. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. So how, how would you like just answer that question? Because I feel like what, what's a cool way to answer that question? You mean like a, the transmission question? The transmission question. Can we yeah, trust just, the scriptures? Just... Can we trust the witness? Like, yeah, how, so I, I, how would you address that? There's two questions here. Okay. Um, yeah. One is a transmission question. Like, has the you know copyist errors, people just adding stuff to the text or whatnot, yeah. uh, has that taken place? Kind of the uh, broken telephone game is usually yeah. what people come up with. Like, oh, you know, these, these things aren't trustworthy and stuff like that. The other question is whether it's actually accurate to the information it has in it. Okay. So that's, the, the, that's what I mean. There's two different questions. To the first question, I would say, look, let, let's just look at the documents that we have, mm-hmm. right? It's, it would only be true um, is if we didn't have earlier documents and we were like, we're just questioning as to whether the originals actually wrote this stuff down. Um, and even in the, in the broken telephone game, right? I mean, what makes the game funny is that the individual that started the word is there. You mm-hmm. can always say, hey, you know, hike. Did, is this what you said? And I yeah, yeah. laugh and say, no, man, like I said, Bob, and it's turned into, I don't know what, right? And well, that's the case when it comes to the actual documents, the manuscript evidence, when it comes to the Bible. That's a good point. And so I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, look, this English Bible I'm holding, which might be a bad translation, by the way, there are such things that's bad translations. Yeah, 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 bad telephone. Might be a good, yeah. You know, and people try to do their best, but let's just say whatever, your, your typical NIV, ESV, NASB, You take this text and you go, well, is it, can I trust it or has stuff been changed? I'm just like, okay, so why don't you go go back a couple of hundred years? Okay, whatever, go back 400 years and look at some kind of a manuscript in in different language, German or old English or something like that. Has anything been changed? Well, no, it hasn't been changed. Okay, go back another 500 years. So, well, you know, you're going to get into like Latin and stuff like that. It's like, well, has it been changed? Well, no. But the Latin is not just from that. The Latin pushes you back, back all the way, right, to like the fourth century. Mm-hmm. Um, and But by the time you're in the fourth century, you're not just dealing with Latin. You're dealing with Syriac. You're dealing with Armenian. Um, you're dealing with Latin. You're dealing with Greek. So now you don't only have one language you're dealing with. You have multiple languages of texts you can look at and say, well, do these two words mean the same thing, right? Like if you're looking at Armenian text compared to if you're looking at a Latin text, it's like, oh, well, yeah, sort of. Well, if you're looking at the, say, Greek text, we're talking about the New Testament here, but there's Hebrew Bibles from the, the Dead thousands. Sea Scrolls. Yeah, <laughs> like that was a huge discovery. Well, before that, right? Like yeah. the, after Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, praise God, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. And that's one of the cool things is that, you know, we can look at Isaiah. I say Isaiah because we have the whole scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is a very recent discovery yeah. considering the last 2,000 years. And then say, wow nothing's been changed in 2000 years. And I would say the reason why nothing's been changed is because these guys weren't like kind of carelessly copying. 
they had a reverence to the text that they were copying. They re- they believed, for the most part, these copiers believed this is actually the words of God. Um, and so they took a lot of care. Now, did they make mistakes? Yeah, the textual yeah. evidence shows they made mistakes. But the mistakes are like useless, right? They're, they're one letter off here, one letter off there. You can construct a word. This manuscript is missing this letter. That, that manuscript is missing yeah. that letter. And they're of no theological significance. And I'm not just saying that, right? Like, well, so- they, well, some of them do, like like the Latin text on Romans could impact theology. But like, but yes. overall, like what you're saying well, is accurate. Yeah, like, like what I mean here is like, you're not going to walk away and say it's it's teaching Jesus didn't exist or Jesus isn't God or so. Like the Bible doesn't. The central Jesus message, God, yeah. Right, absolutely. like the central Christian text kind of thing. Even, even, even folks that are not Christians um, who are scholars in in this field new testament studies and stuff we'll tell you look there's variants there's there's lots of variants but you got to know what they mean by variant but, here but but, but what, what we're talking about too it's not like this was decided like when when constantine converted the roman empire these documents are from the Pre, wi- yeah first century the, the witnesses of jesus's the letters of paul this is 50 40 ad this is not 300 yeah. AD. Well, I, I think like, like that alone is not really communicated. Like <laughs> this is because people are, don't actually look at the data. They hear stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'll give you an ex- situation. I was in New York. Um, well, specifically New Jersey. And we were at a certain um, university, private university, really smart dudes and dudettes. Um, and so uh, we were, we kind of came up with a cre- questionnaire to engage the students. We do some evangelism. And a student came up to me and he said, um, well, the Bible has been changed. And I said, okay, can you tell me when it's been changed? And he said, well, when King James translated the Bible, he changed it. And so now this is anybody who knows this knows this is very silly. King James himself didn't translate the Bible. What? Right? He, it, he had what? a bunch of scholars. What? <laughs> and, no. and so that's, yeah, I know. Oh. Uh, and so I said, look, the reality is that King James did not translate the Bible. A bunch of people were working on this. And then we have texts pres- coming before, you know, this translation into English. And I had an Armenian Bible with me. And so I said, this is Armenian Bible. It predates that thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> long before. And I said, we can compare it and look whether it's been changed or not. And then here's what he said to me. And, and, and I value, and I've shared this story a bunch of times, I've never seen this individual again, but I value this gentleman's honesty. He said, you know what? I just repeated something that one of my professors had said. Yeah. And I was just misinformed. And so his professor had said, you know, when King James translated the Bible, he changed a bunch of stuff. And he just ran with it. Yeah. The reality is that they don't go back and look at this stuff that in the second century, we have church fathers coding from the biblical text. Right. And if they're written in the third, fourth century, they can't be coding something a hundred years before it's written. It clearly has to be written beforehand, right? So that's why it would put it into, you know, the first century. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about the, the central message of the scriptures, right? The the Old Testament is pointing forward to it. The the New Testament is reflecting on it. It's it's why we, it's testifying to this event, which we were talking about in Holy yeah. Week, uh, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So like for me, it's like. I don't even know who God is. The God I know is the one who rose Jesus from the grave, period. Mm-hmm. That's the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the maker of heaven and earth. Like, this is the deity in which Christians should be uh, worshiping. Oh, yes. But um, how could you, like, apologize this, like, <laughs> ano- anomaly of anomalies? Like, some guy came back from the grave and is alive right now yeah like, that's what easter is like this jesus of nazareth is living in heaven in a new body like how do you logic like as the philosopher in you how do you logically talk about something that's supernatural look uh, typically speaking people don't reject this stuff because of the teachings of the bible mm-hmm. they reject it because they have they have a worldview that won't make any room for it okay Okay. Very like a materialistic. Yeah. Like, so if someone doesn't believe anything non-physical exists, like they're materialist or physical is, which would include like God doesn't exist because God's not a physical kind of thing. So it's going to be very difficult for them to actually accept that. Um, and so it, it makes sense for me 
uh, when people say, well, that's like an impossibility. I'm like, well, that it's not that only that's an impossible. You just don't think anything non-physical or immaterial can exist. So let's talk about whether anything immaterial does exist. Like right. before we talk about God, let's yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. that. Depending on where people are, this conversation, I'm going to start it differently. It's going to look different. Got it. But look, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, right? If, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then we're, we're sort of wasting our time. Yeah. So the resurrection is central. And um, I think we have to clarify to people that resurrection and what we would call resuscitation are two different things. Yeah. And by resuscitation, I mean someone coming back from the dead. So think Lazarus. Yeah. Jesus brings him back from the dead. Right. Lazarus is not going to live forever after that. Lazarus is going to live his earthly life. He's going to you know, be killed or die of old age or whatever. Um, resurrection is having a new a heavenly body, you could say, glorified body, whatever. Um, and then it's living in that state forever. And that's what Christians believe about Jesus, the resurrection. And it's a central part of the Christian faith. It is the central part of the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, when it, sometimes when it comes to the trustworthiness of the Old Testament accounts and all this stuff, I don't even start with the textual kind of questions. I start with the resurrection and I work myself backwards. Look, if the resurrection happened, then Jesus is who he said he is. And if it happened, he is who he said he is, and he was in his right to select those apostles and commission them to work. Um, and his quotation and approval of the Old Testament and then his commissioning of the apostles who end up writing the New Testament is all the case. So it all kind of rests on the resurrection. And I would just say if somebody really wants to defeat Christianity, defeat the resurrection. Yeah. Go I study it, come up with your arguments against it. Um whatever right like you have to answer that question and yeah. so it's not very difficult um uh, it, uh, i gotta clarify here it's not very difficult to kind of uh say the resurrection happened uh, when it comes to like a logical possibility because it depends on your assumptions okay. if i think god exists then obviously i'm going to operate in a way where god does supernatural things mm -hmm. If somebody doesn't think there is a God at all, well, yeah, it makes sense that they're going to say the re resurrections don't happen, right? Uh, I get it. Uh, but I think the evidence supports a resurrection happening. So it's, it's not necessarily a philosophical thing. I would say maybe it's a historical thing uh, for us to look at. Every single person needs to answer the question of why the tomb is empty. Everyone needs to answer this, the Christian and the non-Christian. And that's what it really comes down to. What took place? Something happened for that tomb to be empty. And we know the earliest story. It's like sometimes people think they're being um, clever. Uh, people who aren't really, uh, I guess, um, biblically literate. By that, I mean they haven't read the Bible very much, if at all. And they'll say something like, have you ever considered that Jesus' disciples might have stolen his body. I'm like, yeah, that's literally in the book. Right? Like, yeah, but isn't that a circular argument? Like, like in, in what sense? Like, like so, oh, how about we can't trust the book because they're, the disciples wrote the book, you know? Like, I, I'm not, I'm just, I'm going to be working for the devil. I hate the phrase devil advocate, but in this conversation, I'm going to be advocating for the, the criticism. No, that, isn't that so like, that's, like, you can't say, like, the I'm Bible, the, the Bible is true because the Bible says so. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, that would be circle. I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. argue that way. But but they, um, they were aware of it, right? Like that. Who was the disciples that like they, they did write? It's in the Gospels that it was yeah, not stolen. So, yeah, it, it's not that it's not stolen. It's that the, they they re, they report in their writings yeah. that their opponents said they stole the body. Yeah, I mean, if I was writing some kind of a made up story, I wouldn't necessarily want to report what my opponents are saying very much about me, right? Especially if I I did that. Right. Um, and so there's a number of things, uh, what we would call internal evidence. So uh, whenever we study texts, um, again, any kind of hermeneutics, but specifically in this case, when it comes to studying the Bible, we look at external evidence and internal evidence. So external evidence would be stuff like cultural things, right? Exactly. Cultural, societal, political situations. And then internal stuff would be from the text. For example, um, an external argument, I might argue, is that there was a better lie the disciples could have told 
that was a lie that would not be able to be defeated. Okay. okay? And I haven't, I didn't make this up. I don't know who did, but I, uh, it's, it's essentially called the pink elephant in the lobby uh, example, right? Okay. So if I, so suppose me and you were on a trip together, you were in the hotel room and I, I came upstairs and I said, hey, hike, you will not believe what I just saw. What did you see, Arthur? And I say, there was a pink elephant in the lobby on his laptop, just typing away. He was working. And you go, dude, that's impossible. It's not going to happen. I said, look, pink elephant's downstairs. We can walk downstairs and you can see it for yourself. And you go, okay, I'm going to walk down. We walk down to the lobby. You look and you say, there's no pink elephant there. And I tell you, oh man, that must be because you're not one of the special ones that can see this reality. Like there's a select people in the world that can witness this. Sorry, you're not a part of it. I'm a part of that secret select group. There's nothing you can say to defeat me on this. Mm -hmm. Because anything you say, I'm going to say, you're not a part of the secret group that's able to witness this stuff. A lot of really um, Gnostic sort of cults function like this, right? Like special knowledge. Um, or you could say, wow, look, I see the pink elephant too. And then I tell you, wow, you must be one of the secret people that can see this reality. So it's not a physical event. You're not making a claim for a physical thing. You're making a claim for some kind of a non-physical thing. And all the disciples had to do was say Jesus resurrected spiritually. Right. But they refused to make yeah, it. They simple. can't be defeated. Even if they brought the body of Jesus out, they would not be able to defeat them because they would have said, hey, we never said it was physical. We said it's spiritual. Yeah, He's yeah. appeared to us, so on and so forth. But they're actually arguing for a physical resurrection. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of great scholarship lately to prove that this is the central theme. Yes. The bodily resurrection. No question about it. And, but that's like a recent, because there's this whole Jesus seminar stuff, and there's this reemergence of Gnostic thinking Look, like you're talking about, where it's just like higher that, power. That was, or that was like, all as a result, I would say. All that stuff was... Oh, man, I got to be careful here, but let me just say it. And then whatever, if anybody comes at me on it, now sure, we back can it away. <laughs> but, um, um, I think that was a part of kind of German scholarship, German liberal scholarship. When I say liberal, I mean, in the, in the theological sense. Um, and these people had, again, accepted philosophical presuppositions of physicalism, of resurrections don't happen. Even if God exists, um, he doesn't interact with the world. Some kind of a very weird, say deism yeah, yeah. right um and so therefore they come to these conclusions they come to these conclusions where um no you know it was a spiritual event it was but when you look at the actual text and then when you especially look at the church fathers um apart from the biblical text right like immediately following they're all arguing for a physical resurrection yeah and they then, all believe in a physical resurrection yeah, and I, I also hear about, like, I guess two other points connected to that is the first witnesses of this physical resurrection were women, which would have yeah. also been, an, like, you hear this all the time now in Easter sermons. I feel like it's like a popular, like, uh, Easter message I keep hearing from multiple pastors. Well, it's look, like, it's important. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is one of those. Can, can, you, can you explain it a bit more? Yeah. Why is it so important? This oh. is one of those internal evidences that we're talking about. Well, culture, well, it's internal in the text. We see that women are the first people that see uh, or witness the empty tomb um, and they go tell the disciples. Um, and then there's an external factor that women's words were not considered to be good testimony or proper testimony in a court of law. So again, the argument is if I was going to make up a lie, I would not have my first witnesses be women in that, in that societal context. Like I would make the first witnesses be the most famous, the most trustworthy like individuals. And you see some of this in the, um, in the what we call the pseudopigraphical writings, right? Later writings that are attributed to some people who are by that time dead. So pseudopigraphas, they're fake writings or under fake names. So um, in, uh, in one of the writings, you see like all of Jerusalem at the tomb um, including like the high priest and everyone. And then, you know, behind the tomb, this gigantic cross comes out with a mouth and proclaims the resurrection. Like by this, it's, it's this crazy event. It's, it's not these people hiding in secret because they're terrified. And then these women who go and witness it and come back and report it. So it's predominantly this idea that women's testimonies would not be valid in a court of law, but 
the Gospels recorded like that gives them authenticity that these are actually the way the events happen. That's partly why it gets used uh, quite a bit. Wow. And I think the it's also fascinating, too. There's like doubt within the disciples, too, like Thomas and even like in Matthew, I think it's Matthew. It says like, yeah, some didn't even believe still. They couldn't like wrap yeah. their minds around it. Look, you I think it's in John, right, where um, John and, and Peter kind of like run to to verify this themselves. Yeah, yeah. They don't. And here are the things uh, that these disciples, a lot of people think, oh, they, you know, they, uh, you, you hear from some of these atheist, uh, internet atheist type, oh, like they're ancient goat herders and all this stuff. And it's like, you realize these guys understood what it means to verify and take evidence and all that. Like they run there. They don't just go, oh, hallelujah, praise God, this event has happened. They run there to see whether it's happened or not. Yeah. So they want to see it themselves. Uh, they want to see whether what these women are re reporting is true or not. Yeah. And then they, and then like, I think this is, this is important that gets neglected, but it has to be said, they all were willing to die for this. And most of them yeah. did. Like, so that's the, one, yeah, that's, a huge... that's one of the other points that one of the other points is that not only are they willing to die for it, right? Like, I mean, look, it's obvious that people will die for all sorts of crazy things. Yeah. Yeah. But People who've made up lies tend to break down in the face. So if you made up a lie and then I believed your lie. There's a pink elephant in my living room typing yeah. over me right now. And, and so if I, con if I considered you trustworthy and I put my faith in you, I'm not, I don't know whether it's a lie or not, right? Um, that's a lot easier for people to like really sincerely believe that and die for that. But when people come up with a lie, the liars themselves, they usually break down pretty quickly. I think Chuck Colson wrote on this and then it, it gets used a lot of how long it took like two weeks for two weeks for the whole Watergate thing to like crumble down uh, this whole lie and all this stuff because they got interrogated and they were like going to go to jail. And so people broke down. Um, the disciples, most of them died horrendous deaths and they weren't even near each other to kind of support each other. Right. Like yeah. it wasn't like, come on, hike, we're going to stick through this and, and go with it. Don't break. Don't break. Right. It's like they're dying on completely different parts of the world. And yeah. again, they're dying in, in horrendous fashions. Yeah. Uh, and they, didn't, they, they kept with that message. And again, they could have come up with the easier lie they didn't have to die for. Yeah, and I think another important piece that I think gets neglected is um, Jesus said, wait for the Holy Spirit to arrive before you go to the nations. Mm -hmm. So like God is with them on the mission of spreading this revelation. And it's like, it's international first century like <laughs> like they go all over the, the, the their local region and it's like in ethiopia it's in armenia it's it's in yeah. it's in europe like from the beginning and and again it's, it's here's one of the things in the book of acts that you see is that they don't really get that right they don't really get that they're meant to take this to everyone they they're so yeah. to keep staying local keep staying local until this persecution arises and and it's attribute like god actually uses that to push them uh to uh, to this sort of work and then you see well it gets it, it gets international right i yeah. know a lot of people say well paul's the one who made it international it's like no jesus disciples went international yeah, yeah so it's not just paul that you know went around the roman world there was people leaving the roman world and going to like thaddeus and bartholomew right because we're armenian we mentioned them like they're going to reach out to the armenians the iranians uh in that region that that, that that's a common um critique i heard a couple of times in college uh, even remember writing an essay refuting it and i got like a c because i didn't want to buy into it and the notion is that jesus never meant to be international paul made christianity christianity yeah it's complete nonsense it is nonsense because <laughs> it's like there's no understanding of the holy spirit's role the fulfillment of israel it's like there's no understanding of this proper narrative of course you can't go international until the mission is completed and Jesus fulfills. And then he says, go make disciples of the nations. Yeah. And, 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 and it completely ignores the fact that God made a promise to Abraham telling him he's going to become the father of many nations. Like, yeah, yeah. how does that happen? Exactly. Oh, it's only in Jesus. Like at least the claim is there, right? So whether you believe it or not, uh, um, it's, it's a secondary issue. Like, but that's the claim of Christianity. The claim is it's in Abraham. This is a promise made to Abraham. It's through Christ. He's becoming the father of many nations. Uh, and it completely ignores the fact that Jesus says, to the ends of the earth, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, like, 
I mean, you still can't prove the resurrection, but you can't disprove it, right? You could support. No, the, so could... I would say, okay, so let's talk about this word prove. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, look, I, I don't know if there's many things we can prove. Right. right? I, I don't know, like uh, some logical stuff, right? Um, we can prove. If we mean by prove 100% certainty. But if it's like that, you, if, you, if you can only believe stuff and live your life in accordance with that stuff, if you had 100% certainty on it, there's very little things you'd be able to do in life. Okay. Um, and so I don't think we live our lives based on absolute certainty. Um, I think we live our lives based on something like beyond reasonable doubt. Um, some philosophers and some Christian philosophers speak about some things called like things that are evident. It's just like, you just know it. Mm -hmm. um, like my own existence. Like, I don't need to prove my own existence. I know some philosophers really try, like, it's pretty evident that I exist. We're in the matrix, bro. <laughs> yeah, hey, possibly, but that still means we exist. Yeah, <laughs> Whether we're in the matrix, I mean, to say we are in the matrix means we exist in the matrix, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so I would say uh, we're looking at uh, that which corresponds to reality best. So I'd say something like a correspondence theory of truth. Um, and then something like beyond a reasonable doubt. Look, we sent people to jail and to their death without having absolute certainty. That's pretty serious. Yeah, yeah. As a society, we think it is a very good standard to judge people by. Right? Like you, you don't go and sit on a jury uh, you know, bench and then demand from your fellow citizens no, no, no. We need absolute 100% certainty. That's not the point. This is partly also why it is the job of the prosecution to prove their case. And so I don't necessarily have an issue uh, saying, well, it's my job to prove the case if I'm going to make the claim that no. God exists. Um, if I'm talking to someone who's like skeptical or something like that, if I'm talking to an atheist, um, then that's a bit different. But when it comes to the resurrection, I think it's a bit different. So I'll just come up with like, Okay, what are our options here? It can't be an infinite amount. What are our options of why the tomb is empty on the third day? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, we'll use the one that's mentioned in the book and then a lot of people say, the disciples stole the body. Is that a possibility? Um, so again, some external factors here and internal. There's guards at the tomb. People in Israel could not carry weapons. And you're talking about the most well-trained military in the world guarding the body of jesus um and the idea would be here right they go to the tomb they defeat these guards somehow they beat him up whatever uh, they overcome them they roll away the stone they take his dead body he's dead he's been whipped he's bled out he's been crucified his lungs collapse right um, we get that again, internal evidence when they pierce his side and water and blood come out. His lungs have to, because that, that's how people die uh, when they're crucified. And then they take his dead body somewhere. And then now they're running around saying he's physically resurrected. That's just too much work, I would say. Again, there's a much better lie. It's more reasonable to say they just left the body and just said he resurrected spiritually. I don't have to go through the trouble of beating up Roman soldiers and putting my life on the line. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's sad that this line of thinking is still happening in churches where it's just like it, this is just more of a moral story that we need to be sacrificial with oh, our love and no. um, it's, again it's not the text look yeah. the, another thing would be um and people have come up with this is that the disciples went to the wrong tomb they like accidentally ended up at the wrong tomb i never heard that is it a possibility yeah, it's possibility but... okay it's possible they ended up the wrong tomb but look at the look at the internal evidence it tells us who owns the tomb it yeah. says the name of the man who owns the tomb yeah. If they showed up to the wrong, wrong tomb, um, Joseph of Arimathea, who seems to be a pretty well-known character in the Sanhedrin, could have said, hey, guys, you're at the wrong place. This is my tomb. Yeah, yeah. Um, or at least the Pharisees and, and Jesus' opponents could have gone to Joseph, talked to him, gone to his tomb, roll it over, take out the body and say, you guys went to the wrong tomb. Here's the body. Yeah, and Paul um, in First Corinthians talking about, hey, the, don't believe the resurrection and go talk to these few hundred eyewitnesses. That's it, right. Like, yeah, then he's making an evidence claim there. There's yeah. people who are still alive, he says, yeah. uh, that saw this. 
Uh, so that's one of the other views is um, the hallucination kind of theory that all these people are hallucinating. That still leaves us with the tomb would have a resident. Right. Right. Um, and, and you got to explain really, really big mass hallucinations. Somehow people are hallucinating the same exact thing. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. So, um, so w- let's talk about, you said you were 18. So when did you encounter the living Jesus? Like what, what's your story? Cause it's like, at the end of the day, it's not just to prove the resurrections to get people to, to experience yeah. Jesus. Uh, sure. So we want them to come to know Jesus. That's yeah. the point of it, right? Like we give right. evidence and reason so that people would, would come to believe and put their trust in Jesus. Um, so I was, when I was in 11th grade, I'd sort of had an existential crisis of sorts. Um, and uh, it, it wasn't very obvious to people around me. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and I've figured out ever since what this was. And it was that I naturally have a philosophical bent. Um, and so questions like, do I really exist? What's the purpose of life? Um, these sorts of questions would keep me up late into the night. And by the way, I was a pretty lousy student. I wasn't like super nerdy. I became super nerdy after I started following Jesus. Um, but, um, so these questions would really keep me up at night. And, um, I, I really didn't know where to search, where to look for this stuff. Um, I was brought up in an extremely nominal Armenian apostolic home, Easter, Christmas, you know, um, I'd never been told that Jesus had died for my sins. Um, and so, I, I mean, we had crosses everywhere. I of wore a cross around my neck, but I didn't know that he was for my sins. That he died. I knew he died, <laughs> but for what, right? Because uh, he was a nice guy. Um, and so when I was going through these, uh, these questions, I started searching different religions and opinions on this stuff. Um, and I wasn't really considering Christianity because I thought I knew what Christianity was because that's kind of what I grew up in so i started reading um sort of anything i can get my hands on uh but stuff from hinduism and buddhism so some more eastern stuff but what really got my attention now uh, let me time stamp this because it's important so this is 2003 mm-hmm. lots of stuff is going on in america and islam is in the news all the time and one of the things that happened is that i i looked at muslims and islam and i was like man these guys really believe this stuff yeah, the Ramadan right now, they're like fasting. They're, yeah. yeah, I don't know many Christians fasting for Lent. Yeah, <laughs> they're very serious about it. And so that was very appealing to me, the, the kind of commitment to it. And I would classify myself um, as a pretty loyal guy. And all my friends, I, th- I think, would. Um, that's just a part of my character. And so yeah. I was like, this, this is serious stuff. I, you know, And so I started uh, looking into Islam, reading parts of the Quran and trying to figure it out. Uh, so in the midst of this, I become a senior and I'm still doing this. And then I met some friends and um, I had no idea they were Christians, but um, they're, they're really cool guys. And we, this is back in the AIM days. So they added me to a group chat, uh, chat over AIM. And uh, after we graduated, so this is 2003, June, we graduated. They invited me to uh, uh, an event and I just went. Um, and it ended up being some big crusade. Uh, it was uh, Greg Laurie's Harvest Crusade. And I showed up there and it was my first time amongst Protestants. And it was weird because I'd, al- I'd always seen these folks as like heretics. Uh, they're not real Christians. Like everything that what came to my mind was like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons. That's yeah. all I thought. And so we were at this event and people are on their knees worshiping and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, what did I get myself into? Like, it's really weird. It's like, stuff. what are you doing? What are you doing? Don't go above the so, open hands. In the- yeah. So they give an altar call and then everyone I'm with goes down. And I was like, dude, this is weird. Like I'm just the only person standing here. So I went down as well, uh, not to give my life to Jesus. I went down because everybody else went down. I didn't even, I can't remember much of the message, um, but I went down. Some, some guy prayed for me, um, asked if he can pray for me. I said, sure, you can pray for me. And then they gave me a new Testament. Um, I went home that night. I read one of the gospels. Um, I don't remember which one it was, but my guess would be it was Matthew. I probably opened it up and just read the first thing. Uh, but I stayed up all night and read it. And it resonated with me in the sense that I'd been asking all these questions and a number of them were addressed in what I was reading. And um, it was consistent. They weren't just sayings. They weren't just these moral sayings. There was a consistency to the life of Jesus and his commands. And so I started going to church after that. 
So that's August, October, um, sometime in October. I remember sitting in church and then the gospel was presented, like Jesus died for your sins. You can give him your life and be forgiven of this. And then I said, this, this seems reasonable. So I want to do this. And that's when I actually committed my life to Jesus. Um, so the rest is history. But that, that's essentially how I came to know Jesus and experienced Jesus. And I love how you, you, you feel like you have this ministry call to, to be someone who could teach those younger teenagers, young professionals, college students, just anyone to tackle these questions. Uh, because I feel like it, I think we tend to, like you said, baby people in school um, and don't give credit to, to teenagers, uh, even oh, younger people like, like I, cause it just photocopy the answers and just pass the test. Don't critically think. And oftentimes uh, we neglect great minds and also just don't meet people where they're at. So it's cool that you yeah. have a lot of your ministry is trying to fulfill that need in the church and in just the education system. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. And praise God for that. So after that, uh, guy presented the gospel you went up you received and uh the, yeah and the, the, the jesus became yeah. the, the resurrected jesus becomes well yeah a I person mean, not some idea you need to prove or disprove it's like yes you, so by worship and I'm it's, it's very important i think it's very important that in this realm and it's it's, it's a weird temptation man when when you te- tend to be more cerebral uh, is to deal with this stuff in um in the idea realm but when we're talking about jesus Um, we are definitely not talking about something in the idea realm only. Like we talk about him, that would be stuff in the idea realm. But we're talking about a person. Um, And so this is why I love the beginning of the Gospel of John. Because he takes this thing that the culture generally accepts as an idea thing. This is the word, the logos. And then he says, and he became a man. Yeah. Right. And and, and so then then we can meet him and know about him. And then even the way he starts 1 John is that this is someone we ate with and touched and heard, right? Like it's all the senses. And yeah. so I think people can still experience Jesus at heart. I'm, I'm an evangelist, man. I, w- I want people to come to know Jesus. And apologetics is a tool to that. Yeah, of course. Right. Like I, apologetics for me is not an end of the road kind of thing. I would say, and I would quote JP Moreland here, uh, Dr. JP Moreland. He says apologetics is, it has two kind of functions to it. Uh, one, it strengthens, strengthens the faith that the Christian already has. So you learn a lot more about what it is that you believe and why you believe it. And then it gives you tools to kind of get through the barriers of unbelievers so that you can introduce them to Jesus. The point of apologetics is not just to destroy arguments and just leave like a trail of, you know, destructive things behind you. It's like, yes, you know, I'm the smartest guy in the room. If that's going on, then you need to humble yourself. And sadly, I've seen apologetics that way. Yeah, Yeah. and it's very, yes. So um, character matters, spiritual formation matters. Someone knowing Jesus and humbling himself or herself before the Lord is extremely important. And so, um, I mean, we can go back as far as Augustine and say, look, we tell people because we love them. It, it, It ought to flow out of a love for folks in front of us. And so we can defeat arguments. We could be tough when it comes to the arguments um, and then be tender hearted and love the individual in front of us, because that is someone we want to come to know Jesus. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think apologetics is a tool. It helps you think well, uh, it helps you love God. Well, it helps you love your neighbor. Well, yeah. Worship God with your mind. It's much needed. Yep. Um, much needed. Thank you, Arthur. This is great to hear your story, to hear your minist- about your ministries. We'll put some links in the comment below. Uh, For those listening, uh, we wish you a happy resurrection, Um, and uh, Jesus is alive in the body right now, and that's why he's not an idea. He's living, (laughs) and uh, uh, so it's just good to see you, brother, and thank you for those listening. Remember to stay caffeinated, and we'll see you next week. God bless.